Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for coming to Res. I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon here. I hope you've been playing lots of games, which are amazing. Uh, thank you for coming to this session, which is a live interview uh, with Mr. Dean Hall, creator um, of the amazing DayZ. So, what you're going to see today um, is instead of reading something on Eurogamer after we've interviewed Dean Hall, we're going to do it right now. So, it's going to just happen and you can take it as you will. Um, we're going to have lots of time for questions from you guys as well, so get thinking now. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle of the room, which is where we're going to be asking people to go to ask those questions. Um, so yeah, get, get ready to get up and move uh, if that's you. So to start, uh, I'm not going to be nice, I am going to be nice. Um, we're going to jump in the deep end though, uh, because recently uh, the news came out uh, on some website, uh, that you are going to be leaving Bohemia and stepping down as day-to-day -day lead leader um, of DayZ. Um, and I think there's still a bit of confusion about exactly what's going to happen, uh, so I think it's um, a good start to clarify some things. So a lot of the um, talk I see uh, online at the moment is anger from people, and it's, it's based in betrayal for them. Uh, they uh, say they signed up for something because you're the face of Daisy, the creator of Daisy. Uh, they bought into this and they say now you're walking away and they feel betrayed. How does that make you feel? What's your answer to that? Uh, well, I think how I feel doesn't really come into it. Like uh, my job's not about having feelings or having this or that. So the most important thing from my perspective is that uh, Daisy delivers on what it needs to. And I guess the important thing, and, and I've, I've actually been saying it for quite a long time, is that my time in Prague and the Czech Republic is temporary. You know, I'm not a citizen of the country, I don't speak the language, and uh, eventually I wanted to go back to New Zealand. I think New Zealand's a great place, I think there's a lot of really talented young people coming through in, in game development, and I want to see that we have a place uh, where, you know, with really solid internship programs, all that kind of stuff that I'd always wanted to do and, and now I can. And I think as well, the important thing for me is that uh, my involvement with DAISY has to be positive for the project. And I think with any large project like that, it's, it's really important that the right people are pulling th it through at the right times. And uh, my theory is that at the end of the year, when we start to push into beta, it's going to require someone with a different set of skills to lead the project. I mean, I'll always be involved with, with DayZ as a franchise, but I think that uh, it's got to be the, the right set of skills to take it through. And I think I've been a good person for the moment to push Bohemia, to push them in a direction away from, uh, from where they were for what was needed for DayZ. But I think longer term, uh, beyond next year, it actually requires someone else. What do you say to people um, who would argue that Daisy is your vision, and it was, uh, that's where it came from, um, and without you it won't have the vision, the project won't have that vision? What would you say to that? Well, I think it's a little bit insulting to the people who work on the project, and it's, uh, it's probably more than a little insulting to Bohemia, because theoretically, well not theoretically, they, they own Daisy, so... Um, and I think it's a, a credit to them that they've, even, even after purchasing DayZ, they wanted me to be involved in, to such a great amount. But I, you know, I think there's a lot of people coming through on our team. I was talking to you, you know, it's getting up to basically, uh, you know, not far off 100 people when you mix in QA in that. So there's a lot of people in there who have been with the project and are starting to grow into it. And I think it's important that whoever's leading the project is actually there. Uh, and, and I guess the important thing to emphasise is we're talking about a hypothetical date uh, yeah. next year, so it's not exactly tomorrow. Let's talk about that timeline um, a little bit, because it's not like Christmas is going to roll around and you're going to go, I'm off, see you later, carry on, do what you want, I'm never going to talk to you again. Um, what is the timeline? How flexible is the timeline? Um, you've said to me before that if... Bohemian needed you, they really needed you to stay for, for whatever reason, um, you would. Um, could we be talking this time next year and you still be there? Uh, well, I mean, I said the same thing last year. Uh, you know, it was, I was going back to New Zealand this year and uh, to be with my family and stuff like that, and, and obviously that, that changed. So plans always change. I think uh, 
if people obsess too much uh, about me when it comes to Day Z, I think, like I say, I think that sometimes people don't realise that now there is a big team behind Day Z and Bohemia have a real vested interest in making sure that vision comes through. And that's what we're, we've really been working at uh, very hard this year and that's why we took the extra time with the roadmap because the response to the standalone was so much greater than, well, anyone really expected uh, in terms of sales and that. We wanted to make sure that we'd uh, paved a new direction and that was why the, the studio decided to set up a new studio in Bratislava and uh, use the people from the former Cauldron studio uh, to really just capitalise on that success and make sure it's delivered. So... When you say things like, I wasn't intending to do last year, uh, it leaves a tiny little window open of hope um, that perhaps you'll change your mind uh, and you'll stay after all. How likely is that? Because I don't want people's hopes to be like, this could happen, this maybe won't happen. How concrete is the decision? Uh, well, it's not, but again, I think that that's kind of going from the wrong angle. If people are saying that, that all the hope is tied to, to me being physically sitting in Prague at a computer, I think it's kind of missing the point. A at some stage this year, later on this year, we're going to have to stop making really big, bold changes to the engine, and then we're going to have to focus on actually polishing and developing what is there. And if we don't do that, we'll continue to have the problems that we're having now, where we release an update and it breaks a lot of things. Because this is a complicated multiplayer game that's based in what's essentially an MMO architecture. There's a reason why there's not many games like that, and there's a reason why there's not many of them on early access. And uh, so at some point, we're going to have to stop doing that. And at that point, there's a danger of... Uh, leading from the front, and, and one of my strengths is really pushing new and developed and, uh, sorry, underdeveloped concepts through. Uh, like a grenade. Like a grenade, that's right. I think it needs uh, a little bit more precision, a little bit more focus on that stuff. So the logistics um, of, of you moving away from the project, do you know who you will hand it to? Uh, we don't have anyone specifically now, but I, I mean, it's the, the, whole, the whole point of, of DayZ and from my, my presentation a couple of days ago, we, we kind of treat the community a bit like uh, investors, I guess. So that's why e even the terminology we use, assigning stuff to quarters of the year, that kind of thing, it's, I guess that's the, that's the approach we're taking, to be very transparent. Uh, sometimes, you know, it causes us a bit of an issue. But yeah, uh, I guess it's just opening a dialogue and saying, uh, we need to make sure that whoever leads the project is the right person at the right time. And I certainly think, and so does Bohemia, at the moment, that's definitely me. But at some time in the future, it's, it's probably going to be someone else. Okay. Um, and then when you do um, move back to New Zealand um, and start running your own studio, um, what will your involvement be in or with DayZ then? Because um, you're still... Um, you still have a vested interest in it doing well. You're not going to, you know, you don't leave it behind to rot, don't care. You know, what, what happens then? Uh, well, you know, I consider Mark and a lot of the guys at Bohemia are close personal friends. So uh, I think they will we'll always be involved. And I think even when we first signed the contract, that was what we said, you know, basically agreeing that we we're all agreeing to, to basically be t together and involved in a long time. And I think that... But I, I, I guess the, the most important thing for me is that Daisy this year, it has to get on top of its bugs. At, at, at some point, it's going to stop being cute and it's going to stop being, oh, it's just alpha and it's going to need to start being, okay, well, these serious issues need to be dealt with. So that's, I guess, priority number one. But once we've reached that point, it's kind of like when Minecraft went 1.0, there was still new content. But the new content is of a different flavor. It's more of a polished and rounded. It's not very aggressive redevelopment of the game. And so how we approach that will dictate what my involvement is. Will you have power or veto um, over any big new features or perhaps ideas of you know, sequel or taking the game in a various direction? If Bohemia said, we're going to do this, what could you do about it? Would you well, still be involved? I guess that's the curious thing about Bohemia, and you've been to the studios. They don't really think like that. Marek doesn't walk around and be like, we're doing this, we're doing that. He, he, he's just genuinely interested in games, and he just likes seeing people working on stuff. And he's, he's 
uh, and and everyone there is kind of you know they they tolerate failure because they see it as being part of part of development and part of growing and, and things like that. So it's not really like anyone has any particular veto power. It's the same as how we develop. Like uh, uh, Peter, one of our senior designers, so he's taking much more of a forward role in terms of the development of the design. And not an actual forward role. Not an actual forward role, although I'm sure he could. You know, he's from Slovakia. <laughs> I wouldn't mess with him. And uh, um, so it's, it's, we, we do it more collaboratively because the project grew from this sort of accidental thing where it was just a couple of people working on it and it's grown so much over one year and then two years uh, it means that we we all have to sort of know what's going on and we all have to work together yeah um, I hope that's uh, cleared up some questions I know people have had about um, about what they've read um, if you still have questions obviously you know feel free to ask them um, in a moment but getting back to um, to Day Z, it's been for you. Um, I've just written a big profile piece um, about Dean Hall and his story uh, and the many amazing things he's done, such as uh, nearly die um, and nearly starve and uh, climb a mountain uh, and make a game. Um, and you've made this game twice: once into the mod, and then again into the standalone. What's been your favourite memory or your proudest moment along the way? Hmm, that's a tough one, I guess. Um... Probably, I think there was a point uh, when I first released the mod that I, that I knew it was going to be quite big. And I think it was probably when we found out this uh, Russian streamer was streaming the game and he had a thousand people watching. And, uh, and then we actually joined the stream and started talking with them. And I guess, I, I, and I think I was walking back home after that, the place I was staying in Bruno in the Czech Republic. And I guess it started to just dawn on me, I was kind of pinching myself saying, wow, this is, this is getting really crazy. And every day we were doubling our concurrence. Um, I remember when it was blowing up, it was, it was blowing up quite significantly. Um, so for you, a, a fascination with multiplayer games came from a young age, uh, gaming with context, uh, as you call it, which isn't necessarily what you're doing in the game, but the community uh, that surrounds it. Um, but then a, a fascination with survival came after your uh, experience in the jungle of Brunei, I think it was, when you deployed there. Can you tell um, these guys perhaps a, a bit about that? What, what moment did that fascination with survival seep in? When was it you thought... Bah. Well, I suppose it wasn't like a light bulb turning on as such. I mean, I guess I just hadn't kind of drawn the dots. And I think a lot of people have been like this. Like, some people are like, oh, wow, survival's this really new thing. I don't think it is. I just, maybe we didn't spell it out so much. Like if you go to the retro booth over there and look at a lot of the, the older games that came out on like the Commodore 64 and things like that, by their very nature, they were survival games because if your you know, computer turned off or something like that, you've lost everything and you're starting again. So, uh, but I guess when I'd finished the training on survival, because of some of the experiences I had, I was really fascinated to see if those could be translated through in a game or maybe even a training tool for soldiers or something like that. So I was just, I guess I just felt like I was annoyed that games seemed to be a lot about being fun. And when I thought about good books I read, we were talking about The Road by Cormac McCarthy the other day. Uh, they, they're not necessarily fun. In fact, they're, in some cases, I would not call The Road fun at all. I'm not like, yeah, you know, I'm going to sit down and read about terrible yeah. things happening to people. And, uh, and so... You know, it's, in my, my opinion, it, it, was, it was important to see that, that games were dealing with, with quite mature themes and, and making us think about things and feel things and feel anger and loss and deal with all those things. Is there a particular feeling, uh, again, when we were talking the other day, we were talking that Daisy has accomplished something or some things that you want to accomplish. Is there a particular feeling or experience that you're really striving to recreate uh, in a game. Is there a particular thing that you can think of? Well, I think it's... I think back to when I was playing, uh, like, Frontier Elite as a kid, and I was just so immersed in playing that game. It's one of David Brabrand's games. And, uh, and, um, and I was just so immersed in it, and I was so... Everything about it I was thinking about... I didn't have the internet, so this was just, this was just kind of everything. And I guess... 
that's what I want to see in a game, like where you go on it with your friends and you're building stuff and you've actually created something in this separate little world. And that's what I think video games do that's so amazing is you can actually explore stuff and, and do stuff that you can't do in real life. It's like uh, I've been watching Cosmos re- recently, the remake of, um, of Carl Sagan's original documentary. And I love how they talk about the ship of the imagination, right? And that you can do whatever you want. And I think that, that for me, I, I just want to see games push more and more into that. I know there's a, there's a huge market for games that have a very linear storyline, but for me, it's about logging into something with your friends, even with your family, and then having these, these experiences and creating stuff and having stuff be lost and all this stuff. Because it doesn't, doesn't damage your real world, but allows you to explore yourself and a world. So as you... Um go on to do um, other things, other games. Um, are these going to be multiplayer survival games? Is this a Dean Hall thing now? Or will we see something quite different? Uh, I don't know. I guess, see, the, the hardest thing is uh, for me, to go on for a little bit of a tangent, is I'll read people getting really angry that I say I'm leaving or whatever, or then you say, what's the next thing? For me, it's very hard for me to think about that because I go back and we work like 20 hour days on day Z. So for me, that seems like a very long way away, you know, not even starting to think about it before the end of the year. But having said that, I, it's not that I'm solely interested in multiplayer games. Like I was talking about The Escapist that, I, that yeah. I saw that I really liked, which is a single player game. But I think it's... It's, it's beyond open world that I want. I think open world, it's, it's a very simplistic way to talk about those games that let you really explore stuff with your friends and create stuff. And, and I guess I'm just fascinated on seeing where that can go. I think that the technology is really starting to come together for it, things like you know VR and, and all that. And, and I think, hopefully, that MMOs are ready to take that leap and stop being, you know, theme parks that people just go on and have some fun yeah. and they actually be about building stuff and exploring stuff with your friends. And I think, like, Res is a great example. I mean, there's lots of people out there like me who I have all these friends and, and thankfully, because of the success, I've met them. But a lot of my, maybe my closest friends now are people that I actually play video games with online in another country. And you have a lot of uh, people following streamer groups and stuff like that. And, and you have all these social interactions. So I think there's something really powerful going on with that that I don't think a lot of uh, big developers and publishers really quite understand yet. It's not just social media. It's, it's going a bit beyond that. But games like Daisy are, are helping them go in that direction. Um, OK, we're going to open up this now to your questions. Um, while you're mentally warming up, um, I'm going to have Dean uh, physically warm me up uh, in the style of his army training. Um, so, Dean, if you could take us through a, a little army warm-up, that would be okay. fantastic. We'll see how it goes with these, uh, with these things. But first of all, you can't, because it's, it's cold in the UK, say, compared to Singapore, you want to do a bit of running, so you've got to lift your knees higher there. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> yes, knees higher, so... Uh, you don't have your, your hat on and your inside, so you shouldn't be saluting, but that's fine. <laughs> so um, once, you'd, once you'd warmed up a bit, maybe, uh, you've got the blood flowing a bit, you, yeah. you'll do a press-up. So I okay. don't want to move those because I think they've like positioned them. But if you, if you want to do a, pr- a proper press-up, you've got to get your hands like shoulder-width apart like that. <laughs> and uh, you've got to make sure that you keep your back like fully straight. Okay. And uh, you need to bring your hands a little bit forward like that, and then you come right down to here with your chin up slightly, and then right back up. So there you go. So repeat, okay. and up, okay, I'm pumping and down, and up. Okay. And so we do that plenty more times, but you know, yeah, you're, let's you're not a journalist, so I don't, I don't want to go too hard. <sighs> and uh, and uh, then we'd, we'd probably move into some uh, bicycle crunches and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Let's not do those. Um, and, and also for, for the people here, um, I just want you to have a real practical demonstration of what to do if a zombie attacks you in real life, uh, okay, because there's, there's every chance it could happen, especially if you were to talk to Dean Hall's brother, who is a, a virologist, uh, viruses and infections are quite scary. So Dean Hall is going to repel me, uh, and I'm a zombie, so I'll, I'll come at him, so to speak. Okay, so I told you the other day, you'd go like that. Okay. So this is CQB tactics, so like that, and then you come up and you get your foot down down here. I don't want to get too graphic <laughs> like we did the other day because yeah. So that's a crouch. 
and a stamp down yeah, the you ship. You know, my, my soldiers are probably cringing because I am like, I was like the least badass officer on my officer training. So. What's the most badass thing that you did? Uh... Oh, I'm not sure. Probably, probably. Uh, oh, I did really well in my operational fitness testing, so that was on my first day. But fantastic! Where you go, Sergeant Sergeant Hall? There. Um, well, I was an officer. I officer was, Hall. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sounds like an officer Hall. Hall. Officer. Anyway. Um, okay, we have some people ready for questions. Uh, fantastic. So step forward, embrace the microphone, uh, and fire away. How do you embrace like the microphone? Is this okay? Is this embracing enough? That's fantastic. Oh, I know this chair. Well, I don't have any idea who you are. You better uh, have a good question. <laughs> Your desire to move back to New Zealand is inspirational to other people that might be... Mo- might be I'm sorry, I'm getting an echo here. I can't talk. Uh, that might be wanting to move back to their home, having moved somewhere else to work in video games. Do you believe that you can be the leader that grows the Australasian gaming industry to a new place? Yeah, well, I really hope so, and I think it's a really underrated area of the world. And if you look at like what Peter Jackson did say with, with film in New Zealand is a good example. I think Australia and New Zealand has been really hard done by uh, as, uh, I guess, a sector of the industry in the world. It's mainly been a lot of work for hire studios, and it's really soul-destroying to work at, the, at those studios and watch all the, the profit go to, to a big publisher. Uh, a lot of times, developers will get very little money. They'll just get their milestone payments and they won't get any royalty payments for their games. So I also think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people coming into the industry uh, all over the world. And I think it's very hard for them to bring their ideas onto the table. So I think for me, what I'd really like to see is to have a really strong, even international internship program. We can have like 40 or 50 people hired on two-year contracts and let them create their own teams. Like you only need to walk around the booths here and see uh, the awesome games made by like one or two people and it can be so hard for them to do it because they don't have the money to take time off and actually make these awesome ideas. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, the next question please. What are you going to be doing after DayZ when you step down? Uh, well like I say, I think the first thing for me is to, uh, I really think that there's a really strong themes coming through with the, the next generation of game designers. And I think, you know, like we were talking about before, these, these games I've been really excited about. And I think it would be really good to provide a really solid internship program that actually allows that to happen. There's a couple of game design ideas that I've got myself that I'd like to see happen. So I think when we run this, this internship program, the idea will be to then choose the best people out of that and say, well, come, come and make these cool games. But I really think there's a fusion coming between VR, between permadeath, and between social media. And I guess that's what interests me about Facebook buying Oculus, is maybe uh, they think the same thing that I do, is that there's something coming where all this stuff is just going to smash together, and and we're not just going to have theme park MMOs anymore. Also, when are you bringing wireless to Daisy? The, the whitelist, sorry? Yeah. Oh, for private hives? Yeah. Uh, we don't have a specific date yet. Uh, basically, we've been experimenting with how it works. I think there's a lot of issues that we have to cross before we get to that point, and it's the same with modding support. We, we really have to fix the game. I think that's the, that's the key first milestone step. Please do it, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question, please. Um, so I, I'm of the opinion that for a long time the key building blocks that make Daisy good have been around. It's not like now is a point in technology where it was possible. Mm-hmm. It was your vision that brought that to light and made it viable. And I think there's no doubt in the community about the technical skill set of mm-hmm. Bohemia and their ability to execute on a vision. It's more so about going forwards. Can you talk about any tangible steps or activities that you're taking with Bohemia to make sure that when you step away, the boundary and control and discipline that your vision gives to that team will continue? Because that's probably an area that the whole trust vision thing comes from. And I understand you have faith in Bohemia, but you're the only tangible evidence of vision that will drive the project that we have evidence of so far. Yeah, I guess what I'm hoping is 
and, and maybe this is, has been a bit of a training course for me, is that uh, I can set up a team and push them in the right direction and then train and work with them so that they develop into those, into those roles. And I, I really think that our team is starting to do that now. So I, I guess it's my hope that that's the case, is that that's actually what happens, that I've managed to, to take a team and push it in the right direction. Because I think that's really the difference between leadership and management. Uh, a manager will just keep people doing something. But I think if, if you look more at leadership, it's about basically growing someone to do your job. And I think when I, when I think of good leaders that I know, that's, that's essentially what they've done. So I'm hopeful that that's what we're doing, but we're kind of halfway through the process. The, the remaining 12 months will say, will say what happens, basically. And, and I think that it'll be very obvious to everyone very quickly whether or not I've been any good at that towards the end of the year. And that's when we'll basically need to do a, uh, I guess, a, a review, a peer review with the community and say, how have we gone this year? Uh, and, and have we gone far enough? And have we established the vision and, uh, and trained the people up to be able to carry it forward? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Um, I've got two quick questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, the first question is, uh, knowing what you know about the uh, game engine, do you regret the decision to stick with that engine for the further development of Stasi Standalone? And the second question is, um, you talk about being immersed, being a big part of the game, which obviously is for a lot of people. Um, and I'd just like to know how you are looking to sort of utilise the day-night cycle, maybe introduce, you know, like night vision goggles and hunting that may, you know, certain animals on the night, for example. And I think it'd be quite cool to uh, be in a group on the night time where you got night vision on and you can see like a fire in the woods and you don't know if there's people there. Um, so yeah, those are the two questions I've got. Yeah, so um, I guess, uh, what was the first one again? I was thinking about <laughs> the second one. Knowing what you know uh, about the, um, how scalable and whether or not it's first. Oh, that's right. Did I, re did I regret going with the engine? No, I mean, look, it's very easy to, to look back and say, well, I should have done this and I should have done that. And when I look back, the one big glaring thing I think we should have done more of is in June when we first said, right, this is definitely what we're going to do. We're going to do a standalone. I think that was 2012. Uh, I, I should have just stopped us for three months and not done any development at all and just said, let's do a plan. Uh, in fact, let's do three plans. Let's do a plan if it goes as it is now. Let's do a plan if it's really successful. And let's do a plan if it's insanely successful. And I think that would have made a big difference. People get really hung up on the engine or this or that. I think really the time that we've, that we've squandered has been when we had to redo the plan because it became more successful than we thought. And then we were like, whoa, you know that thing we said we wouldn't do because it was going to be too hard? Now we have to do that. And uh, if, if we'd chosen any other engine, you, you, it can add two years to the project like instantly, like just, just tack it on. Uh, any other engine at all. And if you want to make an engine from scratch, you could probably add five years and the possibility of it never happening. So I guess that's, I hope that sort of explains to you there where I'm coming from there. I, I definitely wouldn't say I regret. I think most of the regret is really on me for not planning enough at the start. It's just so tempting. When you've got this thing, you know other people are doing it, you're like, let's just, let's just start making it, we'll clean it up as we go. And it's like the, the stupidest thing to do. But. Hindsight's 2020. Uh, and the uh, part about how to utilise the day-night cycle to add more like varied aspects. Yeah, it's a good question as well because I think the night time is really important in DayZ. It's actually my favourite time to play DayZ. So I think it's going to help a bit when we introduce some of the good old classics like road flares. There's just something awesome about road flares. Do they have road flares in Alien Isolation? The I didn't see any. Does anyone know? Do they have road flares? Maybe? I, I don't know. Maybe they do. I hope they do, because road flares are an awesome part of Alien. Let's hope they're watching. You know, they, I, if people don't know what I mean. They're the things you, you like light them up and they're red and they go like and make light. They do it on all the war films. Mm. Uh, and, and Jaws, I think. Don't I they kill Jaws with stuff a flare? for a living, because that's it. Yeah, um, yeah, so I guess the day-night cycle I see as, as critical to the su success of the game in terms of the immersion, but I, I think there's no one thing we do to fix it. I think we need to play with how the HDR settings work. 
I think we need to fiddle as much as we can with the lighting. And while options do become available for DirectX 11 if we switch to that, I think it's very easy for us to waste an incredible amount of time switching to DirectX 11 and uh, causing a lot of issues. So I think it's, it's just something we have to keep in the back of our mind and it's something the community need to keep us honest about, about occasionally giving some love to the nighttime effects in DayZ. Awesome, thanks. Thanks very much. Next question, please. Hey, you released DayZ quite early in development. Uh, lean forward just a little Sorry. bit to the... Did you get that or? Try to do it again. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you released DayZ quite early in development. Would you do that again? Ah, uh, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm off two minds of it. On one hand, oh, if you look at DayZ, there's no way that, uh, that we'd be sitting here now if, if that had happened. Uh, I pitched an idea vaguely similar to a... Uh, a producer in a, in a totally different studio in a totally, totally different part of the, the world. And I remember him telling me that uh, while that might be what people think they want, it's totally not what they don't want. And that uh, people, you know, don't like the concept of permadeath and all this kind of stuff. So, there, and I know there are a lot of people, if, a lot of people I talk to in the industry, that's what they say. It's so frustrating sometimes to pitch your game ideas to people who don't play games. And then they're like, oh, no, customers don't want that. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the, the cool thing is that, is that now people see that that's, that's a, a real possibility. I think, though, going early access, you do have to be careful when you do it. I think the perfect situation would, been, would have been for us to develop days silently, up to the point it was fun. And at the moment it's fun, I think you can go early access. And for me, the perfect example is Kerbal Space Program. When I first played that, the scope was very narrow, and I played it for like five minutes and it crashed. But those five minutes that I played it for were amazing. I was like, this game is really fun. And it was the same with me for Prison Architect. I bought into the Alpha quite early. I played it for a bit, and I was like, this game is awesome. And sure, it was very early, so after about an hour, I got a bit bored, but I knew that it was going to be a great game. And so I think that's the perfect point to go to early access. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out that you know all of the investment, you know, the hundred strong team that you've now got uh, on the studio. If you, you know if you hadn't launched and been so successful and on Daisy uh, early access, that wouldn't be in place now, and yeah. uh, all the all the content that you can handle now wouldn't necessarily be in the game. So it's it's a tricky one. Sorry, I'm just carrying waffling. Oh, uh, next question, please. Uh, I have two questions, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, mm, yeah. Okay. Um, is virtual reality on the DayZ roadmap? Come forward just a little bit, sorry. Is virtual reality on the DayZ roadmap? And also, uh, what sold you on the Bohemia Interactive Engine? Uh, so, is virtual reality, definitely. Uh, I um, first met the Oculus guys when I was walking around PAX. And, and they were like, oh, you're, you're the DayZ guy. And I was like, you guys are the Oculus guys. And they were like, come back to our hotel room and we'll show you the Rift. And so I did. And it was a very early version, I think even before the, the dev kits were released. And uh, they put the kit on me and it was Doom. And I was running and I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> this is unreal. And they were trying to warn me. They were like, just slow down, you might get a bit sick. And I was like, whatever, I was in the Air Force and totally cool <laughs> and tough. And then afterwards, yeah, I felt like sick for about four hours. But it's a lot better now because they've been enhancing the technology. But I, I, I think I'm also aware of that as a game designer, there's a lot of considerations and human factors that you need to take into account. I was talking about it in the panel before, so I won't dwell on it. But I think there's a lot of factors that need to be played in. So while I think we will definitely support it, there's two massive important issues for it. The first is we have to get to 60 frames a second for the client. You can get by on 30 if you do some little magic, but your tracking has to be at 60, and ideally, you, uh, you know, you, you need to be rendering at 60 frames a second as well. Uh, I'm confident we'll reach that. Client performance hasn't been a big priority for us. We're very focused on server performance. And I guess the second factor is games like Eve Valkyrie work really well with motion, not, not giving you motion sickness, because you're always moving. Uh, there's other issues, like I was talking about before, where if your hands aren't in the position that you think they are on your character, it really screws with your, with your head a bit. So there's a bunch of issues. 
And I think the second question was, what sold, what you? sold me? Well, I'd been working on uh, the Armour engine for a very long time. I'd been working at it at work when I was with the Army. I was working a bit on VBS2. And I guess it was just the flexibility. It already did a lot of the things I wanted to. Uh, it had a lot of content that I could reuse. It was something I was familiar with. I, I do program a lot in other languages as well, even in C++. But it was just me, so I needed to fill in the gaps, and, and, and that was just the natural progression for what I was doing. Thank you. Great, thanks. I think we've only got time for, uh, for one more question. Maybe two if they're quick. Don't... That puts the pressure on. Oh. <laughs> My question was just, with all the zombie games, films, everything in the media, was there ever a worry that DayZ wouldn't take off because of just the fact that people think zombies were overplayed? Uh, yeah, I guess I didn't really think about that at all when I made the mod. It was kind of just made for me and my friends. I thought it would be kind of popular in the armor community, maybe not super popular because it wasn't very military, but I knew a lot of people might be interested in it, particularly the persistent and database sort of side of it. But I guess uh, the biggest worry wasn't that zombies aren't cool when we were going for the retail release. It was that people were over, might have been over DayZ. And I think that not only with DayZ being successful, but with games like Rust being successful as well. It says that while zombies got people interested in DayZ, I don't think the, the absolute uh, sell of DayZ in games like that is the zombies. It's about, I, I don't like saying survival because I think a lot of people start using survival and they're not really talking about survival. I think it's about something else. It's about the permadeath. It's about the, the concept of loss and losing things and things like that that, um, that proved it was quite strong. I, ho I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, yeah, it did, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and one more? Do we have time for one more? Hey, oh, we uh, can do a couple more then. Okay, fine. Okay, carry okay. on. Uh, yeah, this is more about the, uh, the actual Daisy game again. Uh, but before Standalone came out, uh, there was kind of a fair bit of talk around diseases and yeah. how you can get affected and then it can be passed on to other people through clothing and things We're like trialling that. that right now in here. We're not <laughs> doing um, is, I saw the roadmap yesterday in the interview that you did. I didn't see anything about diseases on there. Is that still on the cars in development? Uh, for yeah, it's, it's actually done. Uh, we just haven't turned it on, so we haven't released any diseases into the world. The main issue with that is we have such a problem with server performance as it is that we don't want to strain things. We'd, we'd rather get respawning loot and respawning zombies working and not cripple their performance too much. Uh, the performance problems that we sometimes have on the servers uh, um, is seen very quickly with when people get the rubber banding issue where they get pulled back. Yeah. So that we're just very conscious of that. Basically, once we've optimized the server and things a bit like that, we're going to be able to roll, ramp up some of the things that are actually done. There's actually quite a lot of stuff that's done. And uh, we've been talking about maybe some of the experimental servers being limited to 20 players, and then we can start toying with these concepts. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, though, if you get infected on one of these test servers, you could then take your character <laughs> off to one of the others and then start spreading it. So, yeah, that's cool. Also, just quickly, um, when you were surviving out in the jungle, did you catch anything? Uh, <laughs> they were, uh, well, they, I, I probably got swine flu because I remember when I went back and we were trying to do, I was supposed to qualify for some other little badge or something. Uh, I got really sick and I ended up having a fever that hit like 41 degrees Celsius. So like pumped me full of ice saline. But my brother reckoned it was swine flu and he was really gutted because he wanted to get a blood sample. Uh, he wasn't like, uh, you know, oh, it sucks that, you know, you're like nearly like fried yourself. What's like, your, oh, I, could have, I totally could have got a blood sample before and after. What's, what's your, what's your favourite disease? Uh, my favourite disease, wow. Okay, because, <laughs> see, I'm screwed, because if I say whatever it is, there's going to be people who have it, and they're going to be like... Oh, uh, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I guess uh, I find the whole concept of diseases really fascinating, and viruses just fascinating. But they're awful, because of things let's, that happen to Let's people. scare the audience. Tell them something that's, that's fascinating about... Uh, well, I guess, actually what really fascinates me is they don't know why you need a certain amount of, um, of a virus before it takes hold in your, in your body. Uh, so you'd think that if you just put, you know, one uh, 
cell of, uh, of say, HIV into someone's body, that they'd, they'd get it. But that's not the case. You need a critical mass. There's various theories about why that might happen, but they don't know why. Well, they, they didn't last time I talked to my brother, so. Okay, here's the expert. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Hello. So, uh, obviously, we have the day-night cycle that's been added to the game. Do you think there's any uh, plans for seasons to be added in the future, for example, uh, winter? I know that uh, at Bohemia, people have been really interested in that for a long time, and there was a lot of prototype work done, not for DayZ, but for armour, actually, and looking at seasons and things like that. It's very complicated, though, because it involves a lot of texture switching uh, and problems like that. So it's not something that's impossible, but so much of what we've got to decide to do is we can't just take on everything for the, the next 12 months. What we've done is we've said, this is what we can do with the team we have. If we find people out there who can be added to the team and can bring more to the team, we can bring them on board and start doing these kind of crazy ideas. Uh, so I'm hopeful that there's going to be a few ideas that we can pull out during the development and that are a total surprise to people and they're like, wow, you totally didn't tell us you were working on that. And it will be on the basis of us finding some really talented people and then, uh, and then giving, them them, giving them the mandate to do some of this kind of crazy cool stuff. Okay, thank you. What's, what's your favourite season? Winter. Good, there we go. So, confirmed. Okay, yes. Um, how do you plan to deal with things like combat logging? Uh, I think uh, combat logging, as we grow how the central server works, we're going to be able to log more and more data based on how the user is going through in the game. We'd originally wanted to have this working for the initial release, but we put it aside because of the performance effects on the server. So I guess that, uh, that spawn penalty system we have is the first step in that direction where we can look at what a player's doing and we can have the, ser the central server say, hey, you're, uh, you know, you're doing this or you're doing that that's wrong. So, sorry, were you specifically talking about combat loggers though? Or, yeah. So I think combat loggers, we can just build a lot more on what we have already, which is where for 30 seconds the character sits down. I think that instantly deals with a lot of the combat logging problems. Mm. Uh, we can probably get a little bit more advanced than that. There's some people who are saying it should be longer. But I think if we made it longer, we need to have more of a, like, you actually see your character count counting down part of it and uh, in that you can maybe cancel it and things like that. Because particularly with zombies being so glitchy, it's kind of a, almost a little bit unfair if we made that time out longer. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you everyone for, for coming again. You've still got some time to go and play games after this. Remember your zombie protection training uh, because we put real zombies out there, so they're going to come and attack you while you're playing the games. I, I'm not sure it worked out too well because I have to say, I don't think you were the best zombie. Just, no, just I'll, practice. Yeah, I'll practice. Yeah, maybe practice. I'll get better at that. I'll get a virus. Um, yeah, so thank you very much and a big thank you uh, to Dean Hall. Cool. Thanks. You may go. <laughs>